honor to be again on the IIMR, um, especially speaking about the quantity theory, because you, Juan, noted uh, when I was teaching in the, uh, the bachelor degree, mm -hmm. that the students who came over have, had learned the quantity theory. I had insisted that I was, I was blue in the face, mm -hmm. um, because I think it's a most important idea uh, which uh, we have to apply, especially in the present moment. So what I'm going to do is to show how it evolved and then see why it is still relevant today. So let's go to the next slide. This is the, uh, the main quotation, money matters, uh, because Milton Friedman was the one who, in a Keynesian era, said you've forgotten about money. By the way, many macroeconomists still forget about money. They can't, they don't know how to deal with it. And we are going to tell the story, but also say why we can, uh, we have to deal with it. So my story is the following, historically. First, metallic money moved from weight to tail. In the beginning, you had money by chunks of metal, and then <clears throat> uh, they were stamped. So they were stamped by, by sovereigns, uh, first by merchants, but then by sovereigns. And so by uh, stamping it, they put on the, on the metal a little more value than the metal weight. And that difference is, of course, seniorage. Then uh, bank money and paper money appeared. That went on to uh, the leading to the gold standard and the gold exchange standard system, pretty early, the gold exchange standard system uh, with Ricardo in, 18, in 1816. <clears throat> then the gold standard system as a whole lost luster at the hands of the quantity theory. So this is my story today. Quantity theory is, uh, replaces the gold standard rules. And in the 1930s, uh, the gold exchange uh, standard was uh, dispensed with gold, uh, the gold rules, and, fin and finally it was demonetized, the currencies were demonetized in the 1970s. And now what we live is with the hope that well-managed fiat money is possible or even likely. So that's the story I'm going to tell with the help of this uh, wonderful book, which is uh, uh, David Laidler's story of the golden age of the quantitative theory. Next slide. Okay. One. Oh. All right, so it all started uh, in the Middle Ages, but I've uh, put my attention on what happened with the gold and silver coming over from the Indies, that is, <clears throat> from America. Uh, Father Aspiliqueta um, noticed the effects of gold and silver discoveries on uh, prices in 1556. And then Thomas de Mercado uh, also wrote a book by, by dealing especially with the effects of the increase in money supply on exchange rates. Um, one curious thing is that many people have spoken about the inflation due to gold and silver coming over, but that inflation is not very high. It's lower than believed. Uh, in Seville, where the, uh, where the metals arrived from America, uh, in Seville, it was 1.86% per year only. Um, and so the impression of continuous inflation was mainly due to what happened with the other currency that we had in Spain, which was copper money. And that copper money had a premium, or silver had a premium uh, for uh, instead of copper money. Uh, and whenever there is two currencies coming in and one displacing the other, there's a period when both run. And this uh, Chevalier, the, uh, the French economist of the 19th century, called it Chevalier is called it the parachute, which is while two currents are, are, are running, you don't have the full effect of inflation for a time, uh, as Laidler uh, also said. Next. Okay, this is the uh, 
the pieces of eight uh, of silver made by Spain, this became a world currency. Can we have the next slide? Because here we have a piece of eight overstamped in Sudan, of all places, uh, 1796. And I'll have to say something about world currencies later in, in the uh, presentation. Now, the conditions for a world currency is something I would like to discuss uh, in the question period. Uh, you have to start with a large economic area. Uh, the larger the monetary zone, the greater the profit from seniorage. And so uh, the incentive to, once you start having a world currency, the incentive to make it solid and stable is, comes from seniorage. The more stable and solid it is, the more people use it, then the greater the senior the difference between the, the face value of the coin and the weight value of the coin. Uh, you need a large, uh, large savings, abundant capital for ca company finance, investment opportunities at home and abroad, uh, monetary stability, I've said again, uh, I've said it so, and conservative management of public debt is ve very important. In any case, uh, in the system we live in, even with uh, fiat money, there usually is one currency that is accepted all over the world. And that is very profitable for the country that it's using for two reasons, the seniorage, but also the fact that they can, uh, they are the world's banker. So they can, uh, they can have debt in today in dollars. Uh, I would like to discuss about the world currency later because it's something that we uh, we don't really look at uh, when we speak about monetary competition. All right, the first attempts. Now there are two, two or three attempts at issuing fiat money. That is, substituting paper money and bank money for the uh, metal money. The first one is John Law. Uh, the Scottish financier who, uh, in fact, became the Prime Minister of France, uh, Controleur des Finances, and uh, he had a general bank, Banque, Banque Générale Privée, it became Banque Royale de France, and then what he, what he did is to uh, issue paper money and allow people to buy shares in his Mississippi company without paper money. And so those, that, in that way, uh, he was able for a time to reduce the huge public debt of the French monarchy. But uh, very soon in 1720, the, uh, the, 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 the bubble burst. Okay. This is, this is a note of the Banque Royale. Uh, as you see, uh, it's, uh, it's printed on one side. I remember when I first came to England that the five pound notes were on one side and the back was white, uh, uh, empty. And there you had to put your name and address when you use these huge, then huge five pound notes. So this is what you have there. Uh, it didn't last very long. Now, he had a friend and enemy, which was Cantillon. Richard Quintillon uh, was also uh, a good economist and not very honest banker. Uh, this isn't the general rule, but still, that's what he was. Uh, and he, he's believed to either have murdered his cook and uh, set fire to his house, or to, uh, uh, or to, be mur to have been murdered by the cook. Anyhow, you don't need to go through that to be a good economist. And he, was, he wrote an excellent book which was published in 1755, uh, not 50, Essay sur la nature du commerce en général. And what he did is very good economics. But the main, the main thing is that he presented, uh, he presented a self-equilibrating specie flow mechanism for international trade. And then uh, he also studied something that many people, especially the, the, Austrian, uh, the Austrian school, insist on, when money comes into the system, they say it doesn't go all over the system. It goes 
uh, into the hands of one, one bit of society and then the other, and slowly percolates to the rest. So that new money usually has, for a time at least, uh, distributive effects, uh, which, people, uh, which people mind, of course. Then he did something extraordinary. Uh, Newton, uh, who was the master of the mint, uh, had been uh, given, given the power by uh, the crown to uh, fix the metal value of the currency of Great Britain. Uh, and uh, um, Cantillon met, uh, met Newton in Change Alley in the city and told him he got it wrong. That, uh, as, I, as I show now, he got wrong the way to choose the uh, money, the legal money of the country. Um, next one. The legal money of the country, according, uh, was silver. Oh, this is another botch attempt at, uh, at um, a paper money. We'll come back to that. Let's go on to, uh, to the Jones Standard. In 1717, Newton decided to uh, have a have a exchange with gold uh, between gold and silver at one to one fifteen percent. When in the market, uh, the exchange or the price of gold in terms of silver, vice versa, was one to fourteen and a half. Now. We have learned something else, which is Gresham's Law. Gresham's Law tells us that if you have a fixed exchange rate between two kinds of money, uh, and also with two kinds of, uh, of metal money, the undervalued currency, in this case it was silver, because silver was worth more than the exchange chosen by, uh, or 15 and 3 quarters chosen by Newton, the undervalued currency leaves the system, goes abroad, is melting. And so when Newton wanted to make silver the uh, legal, uh, legal currency of the country, he got her gold, because gold being overvalued was the one that people then used. That is, gold was the bad money, and silver was the good money, and according to Grisham's law, what you have is that the good money leaves the system. So under the bimetallic system, uh, silver and, and gold can run together up to the point when the undervalued currency, that is silver, disappears totally. And so, so what, uh, what you have when you fix an exchange rate between two, uh, two coins of two metals or paper of two origins, what you have is the undervalued currency, that is the one that's worth more than, than the law says, will disappear. So this is one of the first things I've, I've uh, really studied when preparing these, uh, um, uh, these lectures was Gresham's law. All right. Uh, let's go back to, uh, to, uh, to the Asinia, if, if I may. Okay. back, go forward, there I can see it, a bit more, a bit more, next one, up, all right, here we are. This was another attempt at paper money uh, during the French Revolution. This is a lovely piece of, uh, of history. You can see Louis the Sixteenth in profile um, in, in these, this paper money. What they did, which people have often tried to do, was to say that land was the backup of paper money. In this case, it was land that had been taken from the church. And uh, uh, since they wanted to auction these lands, but it took some time, what they did is they assigned people a, uh, a right on church lands while they were being while, while they were being auctioned. But of course, it took a long time and they printed too much money and you had, uh, you had the, the other effect, which is the contrary of, of uh, the, um, which is Tears Law. Tears Law says 
is that sometimes good money displaces bad money. Um, and in this case, you had so much bad money that people stopped using it and kept using gold and silver coins despite the fact that they could be beheaded for it. So we have two, uh, a second law, Thiers law, Thiers, the, uh, the uh, historian of the French Revolution, showing that bad money can disappear uh, when it gets too bad completely. Let's go forward. All right. On. Well, um, I have some historical notes on the discussion that there was during the first half of the 19th century in England uh, when um, monetary policy was applied in two different ways. One was by the, uh, by the group of people who thought that you had to fix the amount of gold per Bank of England note and never move it, even if you had a financial, uh, a financial catastrophe. Those were the currency, the currency group, uh, born with Ricardo or headed by Ricardo. And then you had the banking group who held that one should be flexible uh, in the rate of exchange, especially when there was uh, some, some kind of financial catastrophe. Let's go on to Ricardo. David Ricardo is something which was the seed of the gold standard exchange system. That is, he wanted, he proposed that one shouldn't have gold coins circulate because they were very expensive gold coins where uh, you had to, in countries that didn't have mines, gold mines, uh, you, you needed to export goods to get the gold. And so he proposed that gold should be kept uh, by uh, commissioners uh, and that there should be paper money circulating instead of gold at a fixed uh, and responsible, responsible exchange rate. So he is the one who starts the gold exchange system. Uh, Propose that. And this slowly through the 19th century uh, was extended and in the end uh, the gold exchange system, which is all the gold held in uh, by a central bank or by commissioners and paper uh, being used for trade and for saving and so on, paper being used for that, um, with, um, uh, with the guarantee that there was a fixed exchange rate between the gold held by the, uh, by the commissioners and the paper that circulated with uh, one for one issue of paper so that they, mm, there shouldn't be the danger or people wouldn't feel the danger that paper was over issued. <clears throat> so let's go on. Uh, this is the discussion I just mentioned, the currency in the banking school. In the, bank, in the currency school was directly linked to Ricardo, the currency school. The banking school underlined the possible need to review the quantity theory given the invention of banknotes and deposits, which uh, from the time of uh, Thornton in 1802 uh, was beginning, were beginning to be recognized deposits as money also. So, uh, in fact, from the point of view of law, uh, the, uh, the currency school won with the 1844 Bank Charter Act and, Act and the 1845 Scottish Banking Act, but in fact it was suspended, the, the currency system uh, was suspended uh, when there were uh, different financial difficulties along after the uh, 1844 uh, Bank Act. Go on. And Mill, yeah, next one. Uh, uh, Mill was the one who accepted the, that the um, 1844 Act should be suspended in the different uh, moments when there was a crisis, such as the crisis of 
before the act 1836 and 39, 37, and then after the act in 57, 66, and many more, uh, the decision was to suspend the one-to-one -one issue of paper money with the, uh, as a proportion of the gold kept in the Bank of England vaults, uh, was uh, that there should be more issue of paper money when the velocity, as we will say later, when the velocity of money fell because people wanted to be liquid. <clears throat> uh, the, uh, let's go back to the gold function, gold, gold standard. Well, what I want to say is that the gold standard was actually seriously obeyed, the rules were seriously obeyed only in the UK. And in other countries, uh, they, uh, they didn't obey them. Um, and the main way that you disobey that is when you have an increase in the gold of the country, the rule says that you should also increase one for one the amount of notes uh, in, the, in the country. And this was not accepted or not used sometimes in France, certainly in Germany, and especially in the United States. And in the 1920s, the fact that the United States hoarded, um, uh, in the 1920s and 30s, the fact that the United States hoarded gold but did not follow the rule of one-to-one -one issue of paper, that is increasing liquidity, uh, made the uh, depression, the 1933 depression, worse. Let's go on to different gold standards. Timberlake has insisted that uh, you shouldn't speak of one gold standard, but different gold standards by time and country. So the impression we get today is the gold standard was a period of, of quiet and peace when everybody accepted uh, that the paper money and deposits should be one to one with the amount of gold in kept in in the central bank is um, uh, is a f mistaken impression. Different countries did made different things, and especially this is very important for the U.S. dollar because uh, and also the French uh, in 1930s in the 1930s, which was that the French. Uh, received or were able to uh, have, have an income in gold, but refused to see the price, the domestic price system go up, uh, prices go up. And so they accumulated gold, but um, starved their country of liquidity, which made things worse when there was a, uh, an, there was a financial problem, um, which, which was not the way the Bank of England functioned in, in, in the 19th century, when there was a financial problem, then uh, they issued more paper than the rule, and then they went back to the rule, but this was not obeyed in different countries. Next one. So, so the uh, impression, the reason why we like or think of, uh, think with wonder on the gold standard system is what we see in this slide, which is that the secular movement of prices uh, in the UK, in this case, during the time of, of, of the gold standard, as you can see there, uh, it's, it's a horizontal. Prices, prices long-term price, the price level didn't go up. So there was a, a great monetary stability if you took the long term. The trouble is that the short term uh, didn't, wasn't so s stable, and you had, as I said, um, financial problems from time to time, and also that uh, because the business cycle didn't disappear. Though there was long-term price stability, business cycle went on, which, which uh, Ricardo and others thought would be disappear, would disappear, and that they would get rid of the, uh, the, dip, the problems of the business cycle. This wasn't so. And Cantillon, Hugh, and Mill in 1829 uh, showed that you could have business cycle because, A, gold entered the system 
uh, by different doors. And uh, if you had a surplus in the balance of payment, that went first to the exporters and then from the exporters to the, to the people who, who, who made the goods that they were exporting and so on and percolated through society. But of course, it had distributive effects. In the case of Mill in 1829, uh, he said that, uh, he noted that if people were worried at future liquidity, what they tended to do is accumulate gold and accumulate paper, but mainly accumulate gold. So you could have short-term falls in velocity when people thought that there were problems looming ahead. And this difference uh, between what the gold standard did to, uh, to um, secular prices and what it did to short-term business cycle explains why there was such, such, uh, such bloody fights between the people who wanted the gold standard to be used and those that didn't. Next slide. Now, here we start with the quantity theory. Uh, <clears throat> the quantity theory, though we see that uh, economists all tended to think uh, from the 16th century, even from the 13th century, that if you increase the quantity of money, prices would go up. Uh, that was, how could I say, a, a very rough and ready quantity theory. But from the point of view of, the, uh, of economic theory, it wasn't complete. And it was Marshall and Jevons and Ross and Fisher and Vixell who built the theory, or the quantity of money theory. And when building it, and this is the point of my, uh, the point of my lecture today, when they did so, they slowly uh, cut the grass under the feet of the gold standard. And what they did is study the quantity theory and show the conditions under which a um, fiat money could be well managed. And so if the fiat money could be well managed, uh, since gold was so expensive uh, to use in circulation and so on, even if you, if you use the Ricardo idea of, uh, of a gold exchange standard, so the temptation to do away with the gold, uh, gold standard uh, became overwhelming. It's not only, as Timberlake under, underlines, it's not only, or, or Timberlake or Laidler underline, not only the World War I that ended the, uh, uh, the, gold, the gold standard system, but after the war, when it was tried again, the idea of having a well-managed um, uh, fiat currency in the end uh, pushed people, especially economists, to, to think of giving up the, uh, uh, the, the gold standard. So Marshall uh, wrote uh, essays on money that were not published until 1975. And there, in essays on money, uh, you had all the elements of the refined quantity theory, the equiproportionality of money and prices in the long term, the money-to-price causality, the long-run neutrality and short-run non-neutrality of money. In the long run, money was neutral, and there, therefore you had, if well managed, what you could you could have is uh, stable uh, non-inflation. But in the short run, you had money was not neutral. Uh, money stock was exogenous; that is, it was decided either by the system or by the central bank, and it wasn't. Uh, caused by money demand. And then there was the, uh, the dichotomy between relative prices and absolute prices. Relative prices functioned on their own microeconomically, but uh, in, in the long run, money did not affect uh, production, did not affect why. And therefore, uh, there was a... a, a, a an, an absolute price dichotomy. So uh, here we have Marshall very early in 1871 uh, starting to uh, explain and detail the conditions of a quantity theory um, 
all countries in theory uh, fear money. Next slide. Now, <clears throat> the question is very difficult to understand uh, quantity theory if you have only one currency. That's the way that the people in the 16th century, some of them, uh, used to think of. You have more money produced or, or supplied, and therefore prices in your country uh, went up. This is, uh, it's, it's two currencies vying with each other. It's two metals vying with each other that allow you to fully analyze the quantity theory. So, um, one, when, when in the period after uh, 1870, when the quantity theory was analyzed, it was also the period of discussion about bimetallism, because some producers uh, complained about the uh, deflationary effects of, of the uh, gold standard, especially in America, especially agriculturists in America, and asked for silver to come back, but at least both silver and, and gold to be used so that you didn't have very harsh effects on some parts of the economy uh, of gold and the, the good effects of, in other parts of the economy, especially the financial parts uh, uh, of gold. And therefore, at the turn of the century, you had strong political resistance to the gold standard. You know, we all remember William Jennings Bryan's crown of thorn and cross of gold speech, um, asking for silver to come back. Uh, and by the way, uh, the wonderful Wizard of Oz being a skit on the gold standard, um, saying that the uh, but gold, when you went behind uh, the seas, you could see it was nothing. It wasn't uh, solid by itself. So Irving Fisher uh, wrote in 1911, The Purchasing Power of Money. And here we have another important thought to understand the quantity theory. First, you have the equation of exchange. And that is a tautology, because MV equal, um, equal, equal PT, which is transactions, or PY, that is true for every situation, because if M goes up, uh, P, P will have the effect of M, but then V will change it and, and T again. So here you have no observable situation where that equation of exchange is wrong. Now, on the basis of this equation of exchange, he frames a theory, uh, a quantity theory, and that quantity theory was that prices were a function of money given that uh, uh, given that velocity was stable or fell slowly um, along the years, and also given that uh, there was no increase, or assuming there was no increase in production. So we have to distinguish between the equation of exchange tautology and the quantity theory, which is what we saw with Marshall, that that um, that that causation went from money to prices, and not the other way, and not the other way around. Next slide. Now, velocity is um, in the cash in the bag, because velocity is a function of two variables. One, a, a fall in velocity uh, secularly, because the more monetized economies become, uh, then uh, the, the demand for money or, or for money for transactions increases. And therefore, in the long run, with, with the countries becoming more financial and more monetized, then you have V falling slowly uh, by a small amount every year. On the other hand, there was another reason for, uh, for money being demanded, and that was expectations. 
uh, if you thought that a financial crisis was looming or had appeared, then you wanted to be liquid. And that makes velocity increase very quickly and therefore reduces the effect of the increase in M on pricing. And this may be something that we are seeing today. Or we've seen in these uh, periods after, after the 2008 crisis that people want to be more liquid because they feel that uh, financial crises are coming. And this is going to happen also today after the COVID-19 uh, crisis. So you need to uh, have a theory on velocity to understand how the quantity theory functions. Now, Irving Fisher also distinguished between real interest rates uh, and nominal or money interest rate and and uh, was one of the initiators of the index number theory to be able to say something about uh, the price level and so on. Let me go on to the next one. Now, Ludwig Sell. <clears throat> Ludwig Sell had an interest rate theory of inflation, not as we should see later, a money quantity theory of inflation. And this has been most influential. A, on the Austrians, the Austrian school, uh, who, uh, who think, uh, as Ludwig Sell said, that you have an inflation when the natural, uh, the natural rate of interest is below, you have an inflation when the natural rate of interest is lower than the money rate of interest. Uh, uh, is, is, uh, you have a deflation when the natural rate of interest uh, is uh, above the money rate of interest and vice versa. So what Vixel had with a theory, uh, an interest rate theory of inflation, was the beginning of uh, what we've seen in the 20th century, is the belief, which is the belief that central banks can manage inflation and manage production by changing the bank, the bank rate. This, in fact, is a, um, a consequence of what the Bank of England did under the gold standard during the 19th century. The Bank of England changed the bank rate uh, to, to forestall what they saw as either an increase in the income, uh, in the gold income of the country, or a fall in the gold income of the country. And therefore, uh, was what you had in the 19th century is before you had to wait for the specie flow mechanism to work uh, and therefore that the fall of uh, the re gold reserve in the Bank of England percolated to the to a, a fall in the um, in in the supply of paper money before doing that the Bank of England changed the, the interest rate to try and forestall what was coming or store either the inflationary effect of more <laughs> gold income or the deflationary effect of income or of gold going out of the country. Now, Ludwig Sell changed that into what we see today, which is central banks desperately trying to use the interest rate to govern the monetary economy instead of the quantity of money, instead of the quantity of money theory, which is what I think is possible at the present time. <coughs> now, um, Jim Keynes, uh, John Mayer Keynes, uh, did two things to the theory of money. One was his uh, essay on uh, essay on the reform of money of the year 25. There, what he gave is an excellent review of what happened, uh, of what happened uh, uh, when you had two countries and two currencies. You could either decide that you wanted to have a stable domestic, a stable domestic price level in your country, and therefore what you had to do was to let the uh, the rate of exchange let the rate of exchange float, or if you fix the rate of exchange of the pound to the dollar, 
then what you had is the money supply in Britain being governed from um, or by the United States. The money supply in Britain governed by Well, but then in 1936, what he gave us is a different inflation theory from what we have called the quantity theory of prices. And this different theory was the idea that you couldn't have an inflation even if you increased the supply of money uh, if you had underemployed. Uh, underemployed resources. If the country was in a, suffered a large, la large unemployment rate, then you could increase the amount of money without influencing prices. And so, uh, he, in chapter 21 of the general theory, which people don't really look at uh, carefully enough, what he had is this formula that I've shown here, which is the um, the effect of uh, the effect of uh, or the elasticity reaction of the uh, of the pr of prices of the price level in a country depended on the amount ed or the elasticity effect of the increase in supply, but corrected by two things. Uh, if the second part in in the brackets the minus uh, is zero, then you have a perfect correlation according to the classical, uh, the classical quantity theory. If you, uh, if you, on the contrary, you had to look at the effect on production and on, out, on, on employment and on output. You see, the EE is the, is the elasticity of employment to increases in money, and the EO is the elasticity of, of output to increases in money. But then what you had some you had another element which multiplied the effect of increases in money and that was the increases in wages, the elasticity EW of increases in wages. What Keynes did here, and this is what today central banks use all the time, to forecast inflation, they look at unemployment, not at the quantity of money. So <clears throat> what you, that's why, in fact, Keynes thought that money was not important. What you had to do to avoid inflation and to increase employment uh, was to see what, how the uh, um, elasticity of both employment and wages uh, was to increase in, in the supply of money. Next one. Now, what you have is Milton Friedman's Milton Friedman's theory of inflation. Uh, he, he separated the demand for money from the supply of money. The supply of money is exogenous in the economy, or with flexible exchange rates, as Keynes said in his tract. <coughs> um, so you have the two are separate, they don't move together, and you had a demand for money which was fundamentally stable. And therefore, <coughs> the demand function for money, the real, you see MD divided by P, depends on permanent income, expected average income over the course of one's life, the excess of returns on, of bonds, on bonds over money, the excess of return on equities over money, and the rate at which money loses purchasing power. So what you had in the case of Milton Friedman was, saying your demand for money function is stable and therefore prices will depend on the supply of money and that is the central idea of my uh, of my lecture today that 
money matters and not that you can increase the amount of money uh, without having an inflation because there's unemployment in the economy. What Keynes wasn't speaking of there, though he did in other parts of his general theory, was what happened to velocity and where there was, uh, there was a velocity gap and so on. But I, I wanted to underline these two, the, two dif the difference between the two views of inflation. Next slide. If you're a monetarist, then you not only have this, this different, different functions for supply and amount of money, but you have to study the transmission mechanism. And <clears throat> Meltzer, Meltzer and Brunner, among other people, insisted that uh, we should go back to the idea that Secular, the secular price level is governed. Secular means more than nine years or ten years is governed by the money supply. This is something that people have forgotten today. Uh, I think through the influence of Keynes himself. Then uh, from Bixell and so on and all that group, you have an excessive reliance on manipulating short term interest rates. We're in a desperate situation because short-term interest rates are so near to zero that central banks don't know what to do. And, uh, and therefore, they go back in a peculiar and wrong way to quantity supply. And then also, uh, a greater reliance, he, they rejected, Mentz and Brunner rejected the reliance on fiscal measures to, uh, to steady the, uh, the price level. And so they, you had to study the transmission mechanism. That's for another day. Let's see the next one. All right, so in the long run, as Meltzer says in this passage, uh, there is a dichotomy between uh, the price level and real production. So um, the misperception is that due to the fact that time is required for people to be able to distinguish the permanent and transitory impulses uh, uh, of increasing or, or decreasing money supply. So the classical dichotomy in the long run is what lies underneath the idea that one should not use varying interest rates or perpetually moving money supply to avoid inflation and to influence growth. In the end, growth comes from real uh, elements, the increasing population, the increasing in invention, and, and so on, new markets, and so on. That's where real growth comes from, not from tampering with money supply. And this is important if we believe that since we know so little uh, in the short run about the effect of money supply on, on production, then perhaps we should try and have a steady rule for money supply. Uh, we know too little to be able to play with money supply in the way that people are playing today. Yes. All right. Well, <clears throat> one thing that we have to notice in the story going back from the 16th century uh, to today, especially in the 19th century, is the growing importance of central banks in a quantity theory world. <clears throat> uh, if, you, if you think that uh, you need, uh, that gold reserves in central banks have to be connected with note issue, and also when you have a, a financial, uh, when you have a financial um, crisis, then uh, central bank money supply becomes very important as a suspension <coughs> of the quantity relation between money and prices, then what you have is central banks becoming more and more important. In the end, after after the change, the, the, the act in 1937 act uh, on the Federal Reserve, and also 1946 uh, Truman Act on that, um, what what you have is central the 
Central banks had very important go to their head. And so they thought that they could do anything. And I was at the, at the Bank of Spain. I remember uh, the central bank were put in charge of, of the price level, in charge of production, of the exchange rate, and of credit. They could do everything. And central banks are important in a quantity theory world because what you need is them not to try to do too much. But now central banks are doing too much all the time. And in fact, since they feel that uh, the fiscal side of the reaction to crisis <coughs> is weak, then they try to use not only low interest rates, artificially low interest rates, but quantitative easing and all sorts of things, because they still think they are in charge of the economy. Or by getting together with the Treasury, the two of them can uh, make the economy grow and avoid financial uh, uh, financial crisis. So the, the trouble here is the question of public choice. Can we make central banks behave? Or have they gone too far in a belief in their importance together by getting together with the treasuries? So we, with a fiat money, we obviously discretion is dangerous and we obviously need rules of issue. And Either, either by moving the bank rate or by monetary management, quantity management. And here we have a discussion for today. Which? Should we have rules like Taylor rule? Or should we admit that we know too little and therefore the best thing is for the supply of money, in the, in the broad sense, as I say there, the supply of money should move with a long-term rate of growth of the economy. This is simply saying we don't know enough to do all the things that central banks are <coughs> expected to do. Next one. Now the question, right? so quantum theory is more timely than ever after COVID-19 <coughs> because if in, we believe in quantity theory to explain inflation, then what is happening today uh, is with a supply shock that we have. Uh, the problem that we have today is not that we have too much, too much demand, it's too, it's too much demand but with no supply. So if we have a supply shock as today, and to, to fight that supply shock, we use monetary weapons. And it's, uh, um, it's in Congdon has, is showing uh, in quarter two of two, 220, 2020, we, the money growth rate could be, be reaching 100%. And so, <clears throat> though the loss of confidence may reduce velocity and therefore not make the increase in money supply so, so dangerous, I think that the sharp fall in production why, together with the forecast increase in supply, foretells a sharp increase in prices. Next one. So, what shall we do with the public choice problems of central banks? Should we tell them, be good boys and follow a rule? Maybe they, maybe they will. I think in the end, maybe they listen in the, in the US and listen to Taylor, and in the UK, <coughs> we will listen to Congdon. Maybe. Or do we need monetary competition? And here, monetary competition to have two uh, two kinds of uh, uh, two, two kinds of two shapes. One would be to have a good world banker. That if if the dollar behaves, if the Federal Reserve behaves, then that has an effect on the <clears throat> on the money on the money path followed by the whole of the world. Or we could have some other kind of private currency coming on. And in the discussion, I would like to hear what people think of Libra and the <clears throat> other uh, and the other currency, new currencies coming up. So I end this presentation by summary. I'm not going to go through this, but this is a summary in red of the things I think I've learned by studying for this lecture and some of them I knew before. So this is a summary for 
students, we can discuss that. And the last, the, the, the last slide is our good old Milton Friedman's license plate, MV equal PQ. Well, that's it, MV equal PQ. Thank you very much.